And I can speak. Can, can I speak from over here? everyone welcome to NUPI great to have you all here today we have uh, we're going to focus today on the global peace operations 2013 annual report of the uh, Center for International Cooperation and we have Richard Gowan here who is the editor of the annual review but we also have uh, Mr. Werger Stroman here who is the political director of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and um, Norway is, is one of the um, principal funders of uh, the annual review, so um, we, it would be good to hear from Mr. Stroman uh, Norway's views on peace operations in general and perhaps uh, their interest in supporting this project in particular. And uh, after Mr. Stroman has spoken for a couple of minutes, we'll give Richard an opportunity to introduce the review and then we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. So let me start by then introducing uh, Mr. Vega Stroman. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and thank you very much for for or, uh, for organizing this. It's kind of hard to say to to state our view on peacekeeping operations in a couple of minutes. Uh, it might take a little bit more time, but, but I will. Uh, I'll try to make it short. Uh, and, and to the point. So yeah, yeah, the generous <laughs> couple of minutes, and I won't go for too long because you know nobody probably came here to uh, to to listen to the official Norwegian line, but uh, to listen to an introduction of the annual report, a very useful uh, instrument in itself. And can I just uh, take the opportunity to welcome you to uh, to Norway and uh, and thank you for your good work. Uh, can I only say a practical thing? I've been abroad so many years that I, I know some of the people in the, in the room. Several of them have been my bosses over the years. But for those that have not been my boss and don't know me, I have very strange eyes. It's my left eye to your right that works and not my right eye. So if I look, uh, remember Morty Feldman, the old uh, actor with strange eyes, focus on this side, then normally... Then normally uh, uh, but if this eye goes away in the same fashion as the right eye, there is... Uh, uh, there, there, there's no purpose in listening to me. Okay, uh, for for me personally, this is a kind of a, a déjà vu. Long time ago, when Norway was member of uh, uh, the Security Council, 2001-2002, I was chairman of the sub committee on peacekeeping operations. That was quite a task. That was quite a task. We were given two horrible assignments when we were a member of the Security Council. By far, the worst one was to be uh, chairman of the Iraqi Sanctions Committee. And uh, another boss of mine, Ole Petty Kolbe, ended up in uh, the uh, absolutely terrible uh, position of trying to manage the Iraqi Sanctions Committee. There has never been, I think, in the history of the UN, a more, a more confrontatorial uh, and uh, noisy committee ever. And I was the deputy, so I was giving peacekeeping, which was better, but not by a lot, but not by a lot. And I'm very happy to see that actually over the years, since the, uh, since the annual review started to come, and I think you started in 2005 or something, which was the, which was the year that I left New York, um, um, and started with humanitarian and health issues and other things, you actually managed to, if not answer, a lot of the questions that was drifting around in the uh, um, in the time that we were members of the of the, uh, of the council, at least you've been able to to pose the questions. 
and to look at some of the underlying factor and collect a lot of useful and good facts. I thought, just to um, be before I told the official line a little bit, I actually thought that we would be in worse shape when it comes to peacekeeping today, uh, if you go back to 2001, 2002, than what we are. I thought it would be worse. I thought that the relationship between the troop contributors and the Security Council would be more difficult. I'm not saying that it is not difficult now. I read reports, but, uh, uh, but I thought that it would be worse. I thought that the, and I, I come out with an old legal background, so just the idea that you use force on someone's territory with forces from somewhere else and that the decision makers are not part of the force, that that was close. That was, that was such an immensely tense operation. And as power shifted throughout the world, it would bring with it almost impossible problems. As long as there was a reasonable balance between the force and those that made the real decisions, not the consultations, the real decisions, uh, you, you would avoid the worst. Uh, but somehow the incentive structure, and I would be very interested to hear, uh, to hear uh, your views on this, uh, how it has worked. I thought actually that the confrontations would be much worse. We, Norway has been over the years great supporters, not only of peacekeeping itself, but also to a large extent research and fact finding and collecting of data and trying to think through some of these issues in a systematic fashion. Uh, in the 90s, before I was in New York, I was for two years part of a peacekeeping operation in the Balkans and had some very serious experiences that I, that I keep carrying with me. One of them being that, uh, uh, how shall I phrase it? You, I actually think it's immoral to ask someone to do something and including risk their own life if it's impossible. And in the early years of peacekeeping, I think we came pretty close. We came pretty close at asking people almost to risk their life for political purposes of those who made the, uh, uh, the decision, but it was close to impossible. I'm not saying that we went over the line, but you know, uh, uh, when we were in Bosnia and uh, someone is shooting at you with a 135 millimeter artillery piece and you receive instructions that uh, you should go and uh, establish peace or uh, rescue someone or, or, uh, or establish uh, some kind of uh, safe zone or whatever it was, you come, you come pretty close. So given all of these things, and this was in the mid 90s, so given uh, all, all of these things, we actually have come a, a, a long way. But the fundamental issues there, how on the planet do you organize, bring legitimacy, bring effectiveness into an operation where you use force on someone's territory, using forces that not correspond to those to send them or those that re uh, receive them will, will always um, Remem uh, remain there. Uh, we try to contribute. We have, I don't know, I think we have 75 personnel at the moment spread out on a number of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of operations. We have, we, have, uh, we have, of course, financial contributions. We have a few projects that we drive uh, ourselves. I'd like to highlight and mention the gender issue, not only female participation in the force as such, which in the early days when, when I was in Yugoslavia, if there with the benefit of hindsight, there is one thing I really would have liked to see in the, uh, um, uh, in the operation I, I was part of was a larger proportion of women, not only involved, that you tried to involve in the, in the society that you were approaching, but also on, in, in, the force, in the force itself. That has come a long way, but there's still a long way to still a long way to go and it's something I have first-hand uh, knowledge about uh, the benefits of really really need a great focus and it's got something to do with efficiency and uh, and uh, of, of, of the whole uh, population um, of the whole op operation as such um, some of the more some of the more 
interesting, some of the more innovative and some of the more sort of forward-looking parts of this is the, we had a we had an interesting mission in Syria, with which uh, General Mood, the Norwegian uh, general, led, which really doesn't sort of fit in anywhere. It's kind of an observer. We we have observer missions. We've had several in the Middle East, but. It's a kind of an observer mission that served its purpose rather well for a while and then was withdrawn. Now, in almost in all UN sort of speak, that is, if not a failure, it's a kind of strange sort of oper uh, operation because UN operations tends never to end. Somehow they just sort of ling li li linger on. So I thought it was particularly interesting that you and if you could say, if you could say something in in, in particular about such a such a mission. There's also starting, I think, and I encourage you to go on with this. It's uh, correspond with our with our own thinking. Uh, the relationship between peacekeeping operations and peace support, call it whatever you like, operations. We've had a number of those, and sometimes they just mix because you come up with a with, with, you come up with a peacekeeping operation simply because you need to protect the sort of the political operation. For, for whatever re reason it's there. Some of us have lost friends in those kind of operations. Think about the bomb in Iraq, where I lost at least two of my very good friends. Um, pre prevention, you know, not only the how to stop the secession of conflict, but prevention. Uh, I read the, um, I, I read at night now, Dag Hammarskjöld's mem uh, you know, memoirs and the notes that he took himself. And the the interest that the founders and uh, those that were around at the beginning of uh, um, of uh, establishing the United Nations, how much time they actually spent on prevention. The trouble with prevention, and it's in a way being picked up by these political missions. Uh, the trouble with prevention is, you know, always that if you're successful, nobody will thank you. And uh, and uh, if you're not successful, you know you're to blame. It was a waste of money. And in our sort of uh, where every dollar have to be accounted for, in a in in an environment like that, it's very hard. Very interesting uh, interesting sub uh, subject. And uh, please uh, please continue. You're only in a way uh, way started. We will probably see many of those in the future. New things. The intervention force, the more robust mandate for the DRC. What should I say? I think the Norwegian official line would be that we are cautious supporters for reasons that, for the things I've said already, we can see risks and downsides. But there are some, it's clearly attractive and it clearly probably alleviates suffering and, uh, and opens up for more effective use of the force. But please don't forget that this is, we're into risky territory. If uncharted, it's a, a force have been used before, but it is risky. And it does need a lot of reflection. It's not an easy, um, the, on, the, only, the only thing I would be afraid of if it was people thought that that was very easy and that there was clear answers to the force that is being sent to the Congo. Somalia also, Back in Somalia and being led from uh, from uh, Mogadishu, also very interesting. A final note, maybe on um, a final note, maybe on Africa in general. Uh, when we were in the Security Council and, and, and had a direct hand hand in, in in these things, two thirds of the time in the Security Council was spent on African issues, and most of them had to do with peacekeeping operations. And very much the meticulous sort of organizing and sorting out of mandates and back and forth and who was going to pay for the UN radio and things like that. that that's what really takes the time or maybe the most important policy making uh, institution uh, in the world. But there wasn't really a lot of African input as such. There were some others that always volunteered to, uh, to speak about African issues. Uh, with long African involvement, but um, uh, but uh, and they were good. But the, the difference now, when I flip through your report, is of course that the Africans themselves uh, not only 
not only sort of seizes the, the, opportun the, the opportunity and takes responsibility for it, but have a kind of active dialogue and political process among themselves about it, which is a very good thing. It will expose all of us that are interested in peacekeeping to a lot of African politics, uh, which is complicated. And maybe a lot of it not for us necessarily to have uh, fixed answers uh, about. But it's certainly interesting. And maybe there's a key there. And this is my final thought when I was sitting on the plane this morning thinking about it. Maybe there will be a learning curve there. If you watch the Africans themselves, it was in, in the Congo, in the Congo, it was too complicated. Everybody was helping themselves in the Congo or two. And at some point, I think we had nine or ten foreign states having their armed forces in the DRC at the worst point, which might have been 99, 2000, 99 and 2000, or something like that. But through this process, we're actually, you know, Addis, Addis Ababa is changing a lot these days. It's becoming an arena for for, for, for politics, we should spend more time there, we should take a, large, a larger interest. That through this sort of, that we're, we're all in a way being exposed to, uh, to inter-African uh, politics, we might all of us be able to contribute to peacekeeping uh, in a much better way, because most of the huge challenges still are in, in Africa, and you can rest assured that we will be interested in this, we will contribute uh, uh, to this, we're not going to go away, we're not going to try to shy away from that there are huge dilemmas in modern uh, peacekeeping uh, but we want to with others walk that uh, walk down that avenue so thanks a lot for doing this and please introduce the report thank you very much mr stroman uh, that i think was a very good introduction very useful for us uh, put us all in a and a very good picture in terms of uh, both the official norwegian position and and some of your own insights and perspectives we're now going to ask richard gowan to introduce the and I think uh, more than introduce the report, share some views with us on, on how you see current developments and, and, and trends are shaping up. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Cedric, and um, thank you, Vega, for uh, your very generous um, words. Uh, we at the Center on International Cooperation um, are extremely grateful for all the support that Norway gives us in our work on the UN. And our work is not only confined to peacekeeping, but also covers um, issues such as the uh, post-2015 development agenda. And uh, we have very much enjoyed working with your colleagues in New York on that and look forward to doing so again in future. Um, but thank you specifically today for your support to the annual review of global peace operations. Um, Norway was one of the uh, founding founding fathers of this project back in 2005. Um, like you, I'm experiencing deja vu. Um, I recall uh, presenting the very first edition of this volume um, in 2006 in this in this very room uh, with Espen Barteide. Um, since then, Espen has gone on to run the Defence Ministry and the Foreign Ministry. I have continued to work on the annual review. Uh, uh, but um, over time, uh, we have been able to expand our analysis and I think dig very deep, both into UN peace operations, but also increasingly non-UN operations. And we have built up uh, collaborative relationships, uh, not only with the UN, um, but also with the African Union in particular and um, have been to Addis on a number of occasions to work on this volume and, and present it there. Uh, we also, as you said, um, looked beyond purely military peacekeeping operations. And in 2010, uh, we published for the first time a, a sister volume uh, to the annual review of global peace operations. That was the review of political missions, um, the first volume to look solely at civilian crisis management operations run by both the UN and other organizations such as the OSCE. Now, you can imagine producing not one book like this, but two um, was getting uh, to be something of a burden, both for ourselves and also for the um, paper manufacturing industry. So um, this year we decided to combine 
our two reviews of peacekeeping operations and political missions into a single extremely fat um, annual review of peace operations 2013. But although this says that it is a review of peace operations and has a tank on the cover, I would emphasize that the insides cover both peacekeeping operations, Blue Helmet military missions, NATO operations, and also civilian crisis management missions. And one thing that we are aiming to emphasize through this merger is that crisis management exists on a spectrum. Um, a spectrum that can begin with the work of a single UN envoy, um, such as Kofi Annan or Lakhdar Brahimi, can run through uh, small military missions, such as that in Syria to which you referred, large-scale civilian crisis management and peacebuilding operations, such as the UN mission in Afghanistan or the long-running OSCE presences in the Balkans, and then all the way up to uh, really very large-scale military operations, such as those of the UN in the Congo or even larger still, NATO in Afghanistan. And we think that it is necessary to see all parts of that spectrum. And at a time when we know donor governments are under financial strain and many classical troop contributors are under a degree of military strain and financial strain, it's really very important that policymakers um, look at all the range of crisis management responses to new crises. Because sometimes a military mission is essential, but in other occasions a civilian operation can be an effective, lower cost, and in some ways more politically acceptable alternative. And so that's, um, that's one reason why we decided to merge everything into a, a single volume, because we hope it will help people think about the links between civilian crisis management and military crisis management. What are the main messages that come out of this volume? Um, the volume covers events in 2012 and also in 2013. And that combination, I think, brings out the fact that uh, we have just passed through a very dramatic period of change for UN peace operations, a period of dramatic change that is still unfolding. As the book emphasizes, 20, in 2012, Peacekeeping seemed to be relatively stable or even on a slight downward trajectory. Um, over the first decade of this century, UN peacekeeping um, expanded very, very rapidly. And we went from having around 12,000 peacekeepers in the field to roughly 90,000 peacekeepers by the middle of last year. Um, that was driven primarily, as you say, by operations in Africa. Peacekeeping when I first came here in 2006, was a booming industry. And the number of operations in the field expanded year after year, going far beyond the expectations and predictions of both diplomats and um, analysts like myself. And we all shared the fear that you referred to, that this system would eventually fall apart, that um, peacekeeping would become overstretched simply because of the scale of the operations. But since the financial crisis, we have seen that growth in peacekeeping reach a plateau. And from about 2008 until uh, 2012, the number of peacekeepers deployed by the UN remained relatively steady, um, as I say, around 90,000. There was some investment in civilian crisis management, in part because it was seen as a cheaper alternative to military peacekeeping. So in Libya in 2011, it was decided to deploy a political mission um, to help the post-Gaddafi state rather than deploy peacekeepers. That was in part driven by political considerations and, and the sort of calculus I was just talking about, but it was also driven by financial factors. Still, by the middle of last year, there was a sense that a number of long-running operations could also be drawn down. The mi missions such as those in the Congo, Liberia and Haiti, which had been on the ground for a very long time indeed, seem to be approaching the end of their lifespan. And uh, there was a lot of talk in the UN about consolidation, about gradually shrinking um, the overall number of peace operations. And this looked like a, a very positive future because it would allow the UN and other organizations to concentrate their military efforts and their political efforts in a more targeted way on a reducing number of missions. That was 
picture in mid-2012 when we started work on this volume. There was the obvious anomaly of mission in Syria. Um, but the mission in Syria uh, only involved, at, map, at most, 300 uh, military observers and about 100 civilians, representing a fraction of a percentage of the overall global peacekeeping deployment. And I would argue that the mission in Syria should not even be described as a peacekeeping mission at all. Frankly, it was a war-watching mission that was deployed um, in an effort to deter the Assad uh, regime from continued brutality. It was very clear from the outset that um, it was not big enough to have that deterrent effect. And I believe that Susan Rice, the then US ambassador to the UN, said on the day that she voted for the mission that she expected it to fail. And she said that in public. So the um, Syria mission was a, a desperate um, effort to try and affect the thinking of Assad. What strikes me, uh, reading the account of the mission in this volume, is actually how bravely and professionally uh, the men and women who deployed to Syria behaved. Most of us around the UN thought that the mission would probably never even reach anything like the goal of 300 military observers. We thought the risks were simply too high, that the UN would probably leave most of its personnel in Cyprus or Beirut and never actually um, really get out and see what was happening in the field. It's a huge testament to General Mood and to those who served under him that they not only deployed, but they deployed beyond Damascus. Um, they were able to report um, directly on atrocities such as the Hula, um, the Hula massacre. Um, those personnel put themselves at huge risk for a mission which many of them already realized was failing. And I think that it is actually a tribute uh, to those who work for the UN that they kept on trying even as the mission failed. Nonetheless, and I think that also relates directly to your question about the immorality of um, sending out peacekeepers to places where there is no peace to keep. Nonetheless, as I say, the Syria mission was an anomaly both in terms of doctrine and, um, and trends, and it didn't really affect the overall picture for peacekeeping. What has changed the picture for peacekeeping is a, um, a wave of crises, including uh, the Mali crisis, um, the crisis in the Eastern Congo, and also often ignored, but now increasingly uh, at the center of our attention, uh, the horrible situation in the, the Central African Republic. And um, those crises are demanding the deployment of new peacekeepers. And in the case, um, well, in all three cases, there's a demand for peacekeepers to take on increasing risk. The, uh, the mission in Mali has already been the subject of a terrorist attack. Although it doesn't have a mandate to uh, go out and shoot terrorists, it is mandated to operate in a very dangerous environment and manage um, risks from Al-Qaeda-related groups. The mission in the Congo, um, uh, the, well, the intervention brigade that was added to the mission in the Congo, did have a mandate, as you said, to take on offensive operations, moving from peacekeeping uh, to some, somewhere between peace enforcement and war fighting. And although the options for the Central African Republic are still being discussed, it's probable that any mission in the CAR is going to have to have a robust mandate to take on um, some pretty vicious uh, rebel groups that have been allowed to roam freely over the last year. And so these new missions um, are going to, well, are already driving up the number of peacekeepers worldwide, once again. Um, really significant growth in peacekeeping, uh, the overall peacekeeping deployment, because we need thousands of troops in, in Mali and probably in CAR. And they're also changing what we think peacekeeping means, because we are seeing a drift towards um, something that blurs the line at, at minimum between peacekeeping and peace enforcement. And very frankly, the UN and other organizations are trying to catch up in doctrinal terms and operational terms with this demand for a more aggressive form of, of, of peacekeeping. Uh, the news out of Congo is positive. The, um, the intervention brigade in the Congo has succeeded, apparently, in uh, militarily defeating uh, the main rebel group there. But it, it is very important to say that what works in Congo 
may well not work in Mali. It is one thing to take on a rebel group um, uh, of roughly 700 or 800 people in the eastern Congo. It is quite another, perhaps, to attempt um, long-term operations in Mali facing a resurgent terrorist threat. Uh, I think we face, like it or not, a period in which peacekeeping is going to be pulled into more and more robust operations. And uh, in many cases, peacekeepers will be targets. It's worth saying that in those environments where peacekeepers deploy, um, they're, not the only, they're not the only potential international targets. Humar humanitarian workers, development workers operating alongside the peacekeepers may become targets too. And so, although there has as yet been no horrific equivalent of the murder of peacekeepers in Rwanda at the start of the Rwandan genocide, I think that we have to be um, blunt about the fact that uh, peacekeeping is entering a new um, high-risk period uh, because it is taking on operations um, such as that in Mali. How ready is peacekeeping for those risks? The picture, frankly, is mixed. Um, let me concentrate on the case of Mali uh, because it is still in the forefront of our minds. Um, Mali is clearly a very difficult operational environment uh, with problems about infrastructure and simple scale. Um, what sort of troops are we asking to keep the peace in Mali? We're asking a very, very odd mix of troops to keep the peace. The bulk of the current UN force in Mali comes from neighboring African countries. And although some of the, uh, the troops in, in Mali come from fairly high capability African militaries, others, um, such as those from Burkina Faso and Chad, um, clearly suffer from major, major capacity problems that really affect their ability to operate. And we know that um, the Chadian military has a, a track record of uh, employing underage child soldiers. Um, it is very concerning that we are asking um, units of that type to be part of UN peace operations, although frankly it is a matter of necessity. Equally, a number of European countries, including Norway, have put forward um, uh, personnel for the Mali mission. And just a few weeks ago, the Netherlands offered special forces, intelligence personnel, and even four attack helicopters, Apache attack hel helicopters, to go to Mali. Um, this represents a completely different level of military capability. And I think the question that faces UN peacekeeping is, can it continue to find um, high-end, sufficient numbers of high-end troops to um, take on robust tasks? Or is there a risk that as UN peacekeeping grows again, it will rely more and more on relatively low ability, uh, relatively poorly equipped um, units. I'm not questioning the bravery, I should add, of many of the less well-equipped peacekeepers who we send out as, um, to missions, especially in Africa. I think that African peacekeepers, for example, um, suffering from major equipment gaps, have um, undertaken extremely uh, dangerous tasks and sometimes lost their lives in Darfur. And I do not for one second want to seem to question uh, their courage or commitment. But the reality is, is that there is a risk that UN peacekeeping will rely increasingly on low capability troops because they are what is available. And it's incredibly important that we not only provide um, some European capacities to support UN peacekeeping, but also we continue to support capacity building in Africa so that um, high capability African forces are available on the continent. And also we continue to have um, constructive dialogues with other providers of peacekeepers, peacekeepers, especially in Asia, who can offer the capabilities that UN missions need. One worrying trend that we have seen in the period that we've been working on the annual review is that India, uh, which has long been considered one of the primary contributors to UN peacekeeping, has grown increasingly wary and increasingly weary of its UN commitments. And India has actually reduced the number of soldiers it's providing to the UN. It has also significantly cut back on the number of helicopters and other um, important military assets that it gives to the UN. And um, that is a, a trend 
that um, I think we need to reverse, if we can, through dialogue um, with our Indian partners. A more positive trend that definitely comes out in this volume is that a number of other Asian, uh, Asian, sorry, uh, Asian militaries, such as Indonesia, more recently Vietnam, have been offering um, units for UN peacekeeping in numbers that they did not offer before. And um, although the capabilities of those units vary, uh, I think that um, at a time when Asian militaries are actually improving their capacities due to the huge economic growth across the region, uh, the more that we can persuade uh, high-end Asian militaries to send troops to UN peacekeeping, the better that will be um, for all of us. It's worth noting that in Lebanon, traditionally seen as an area where European countries lead the UN force, um, at least last year, Indonesia was actually the single biggest contributor of troops. And that's the sort of positive collaboration with a Asian militaries that we should be promoting. But returning to cases in Africa, I think the key um, to sustaining long-term uh, African pe um, peacekeeping operations is building up long-term African peacekeeping capacity. Um, something which Norway has done a huge amount for, a lot of your partners have contributed um, a huge amount uh, to, and which Cedric knows far more about than I do, so um, he may have some words on that. But it is still a work in progress. Um, I would also emphasize that I think there is a new logic for European countries to do more for UN peacekeeping. Um, Mali, I think, has come to our attention precisely because, unlike some other peacekeeping uh, missions, such as that in Timor-Leste or that in Liberia, it feels rather close to home. For many European countries, primarily France, but not only France, there is clearly an indirect threat from Mali because of the presence of Al-Qaeda terrorists there. Uh, I think that looking at the map and looking at the arc of instability that runs through northern Africa to Syria, there is a very high chance that we will in future um, see more UN operations deploying um, along Europe's southern flank in environments which could be potential bases for terrorists who wish to attack Europe. I think that changes the strategic calculus for Europe when it comes, for work, comes to working with the UN. Uh, we can't just see UN peacekeeping as a humanitarian exercise that we do in countries that are too far away and that we don't want to send our own, 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 sorry, our own soldiers to. I think that um, we must understand that there will be more Malis, there will be more Syrias, there will be more cases where the UN uh, will deploy um, to areas which are of direct security concern to us. And that should underpin a greater European investment in UN peacekeeping as we come back from Afghanistan. However, having made all those points about military operations, I would return to my starting point, which is it's also very, very important to think about civilian crisis management options. Civilian crisis management is going to be a, uh, a growth industry alongside peacekeeping in the years ahead, sometimes literally alongside peacekeeping. If you look at Somalia, another case that has been of concern um, to both European and African countries over the last couple of years, we see African Union peacekeepers working alongside a UN political mission. Um, in Afghanistan, uh, as NATO draws down, there's going to be increasing responsibilities for the UN assistance mission in Afghanistan, attempting to uh, support um, the Afghan government as it uh, transitions towards standing alone. And more generally, I think that we are going to see uh, a, new, a new emphasis on, on UN diplomacy, uh, like the, the Brahimi and Danan diplomacy in, um, uh, in, in Syria. As you say, preventive diplomacy is highly unpredictable. It doesn't always succeed. Uh, but it's also a mistake to think that um, UN diplomacy is just about getting a few smart people in a room. It's also incredibly important that we ensure that the UN and other organizations uh, have the full range of experts that they need to take on tasks like mediation, um, constitution writing, uh, and the economic aspects of peace building. Although it's sometimes very hard to get troops for UN missions, it's also very difficult to get the right civilians for UN missions in many cases. Uh, in the Somali case, uh, there are major problems with security, but there are also real problems getting the right civilian experts needed for that mission. And that's actually slowing the startup 
of the UN presence in, in Somalia quite significantly. Again, I think that it's incredibly important that a country like Norway, with its own uh, long experience of contributing personnel to civilian crisis management, um, should be identifying more of those experts and finding ways to get them out into the field, either working for the UN or for other, um, other actors. Because civilian crisis management is not something that can simply be left to amateurs. So, in conclusion, we seem to have entered a period where the demand for crisis management is only going to rise. As NATO pulls back from Afghanistan, um, I think it is unlikely that we will see very many more large-scale NATO um, peace operations in the near future, although I note that NATO is probably now going to do some work on security sector reform in Libya. Instead, the burden of peacekeeping, including peacekeeping right there on our southern flank in cases like Mali and Syria, is going to fall to the UN and to regional organizations like the African Union and perhaps um, also the Arab League, which had a short and ill-fated experiment with monitoring in, in Syria. Um, it is incredibly important that despite the withdrawal from Afghanistan, we recognize that crisis management remains a foreign policy priority for all countries and that we continue to invest in the personnel and the equipment and the civilian expertise that those missions need. And I hope that by looking through this very long book, um, you will be able to find some more ideas about the sort of um, assistance we should be uh, offering um, to all these missions. So I hope you will add this to your nighttime reading alongside um, <laughs> Dag Hammarskjöld's markings. You, you will find you will find this may aid sleep more effectively um, than uh, <laughs> it may, may complement sleep uh, more effectively than, than other uh, other writings. Um, but we do hope that this is a very useful tool for everyone who deals with peace operations. Thank you very much, Richard, for that uh, tour de table for for peace operations and also introduction and overview of your or report. Now we don't have to read the whole report. We've we've <laughs> yes, you do. But uh, we we will certainly go into it where we need more information on the on and as uh, Vega said earlier, very useful that somebody is collecting all these facts between two covers and and that we can all refer to them. I had the uh, peace operations and peace building group here at NUPI, and. Uh, uh, we are about 12 researchers that are also focused on, on these issues and um, I think we cover many of the issues that, that Richard and Berger touched on as well. Uh, perhaps just to mention that of course we are very active on Africa through the Training for Peace program uh, where we also work very closely with the United Nations. Uh, we also have a program that works specifically with the emerging powers and a network with the various BRICS countries uh, where we together with them track their responses and interests and, and roles in, in peace operations. So on many of these issues we are we are also active and working closely with uh, Richard and, and, and other colleagues and institutes uh, all over the world. One of the things that I, I felt, uh, one of the things we are working on right now and that I felt uh, Richard and, and, and Berger mentioned as well but, but uh, that I think even needs more attention perhaps than what they highlighted is um, the kind of changes that we are seeing in UN peacekeeping at the moment. Um, we, we've seen significant changes taking place and that the gap between the kind of ways in which we've been thinking about UN peacekeeping for almost 60 years now and the reality of these missions uh, are increasing uh, to the extent that I think it, it requires a serious rethink about where we are with UN peacekeeping. Um, we used to think that UN peacekeeping is very much about neutral th a neutral third party role interpositioning the United Nations between two or more parties to a conflict. Uh, that consent is critical to UN peacekeeping, meaning that there should be some kind of a peace agreement. Uh, we, we remember the famous Brahimi directive to, uh, to do not deploy peacekeepers where there's no peace to keep. Um, minimum use of force has always been an important part of UN peacekeeping that distinguished it from, from others. Um, we always, we, we had principles like um, peacekeepers should not be in, have a national interest in the, in, the, in the places where they get deployed. And so, for instance, there used to be a resistance against neighbors or countries from a region, for instance, deploying in peacekeeping operations. Um, and that also meant that because it was this kind of consensual setting, 
uh, that peacekeepers do not have enemies and therefore you don't have intelligence or special forces or those kind of assertive roles in peacekeeping because uh, there's consent and, and uh, everything that the peacekeepers should do should be transparent to all the parties to the conflict. But the kind of um, missions that we see today um, in more and more cases, um, in, in the ones we've listed here, in the Eastern DRC, in Mali, the African Union in Somalia, the kind of mission that will be required to do in the Central African Republic, the kind of uh, missions that we have had in, in Chad, uh, where John was deployed uh, in Minurkat, uh, the kind of missions we have even in, in South Sudan, we see these principles severely challenged. Um, in many of these missions, there's no or limited consent. Um, it's now standard that almost all new missions are deployed with a Chapter 7 mandate and that there's an expectation. In fact, we welcome deployment of attack helicopters and a more robust stance and intelligence forces. It's now seen as a positive thing in, in peacekeeping operations. Um, we now have uh, intelligence openly being speaking, uh, spoken about and being used uh, um, in, for instance, um, uh, Mali and other places. And we see national interest now as critical success factors to these missions. Countries like Chad, uh, Mauritania, Niger, that are deployed on their own borders with with Mali, uh, something that we would never have thought of before, but that we now see as necessary in this kind of context. So, what we think is important is that that um, we need to study these changes. We need to understand that these changes are happening. We shouldn't sweep it under the carpet as we think uh, it's very much the culture at the moment within the United Nations at least. Um, we, we're not taking a, a stance where we say these changes are positive or negative, but we are saying that it's important to recognize that they're occurring because continuing to manage these missions with the old expectations, the old principles, when they've radically changed in practice, uh, may cause serious problems such as uh, Richard mentioned. And so this is um, part of what uh, of what we are very much involved in at the moment. One of the interesting things is, is I think that Berger highlighted is that despite these changes, um, peacekeeping is not in crisis. And I think that is why these changes are perhaps not so in our face at the moment. There's no Serbanica or other crisis at the moment that's forcing us to face up to these changes. Uh, they they are occurring on a kind of a slow, evolving, day-to-day -day basis. And, and only perhaps those of us who are really studying this in a very close, close manner re realize how significant these changes are. I mentioned that we are, of course, very involved working with the African Union and also with the relationship between the United Nations and the African Union. One of the things that I think we are particularly interested in, and, and I have a question for Richard, perhaps, that he could come back to in the question time. Um, is the, the division of roles between the African Union and the United Nations. We've seen before that there, there used to be this emerging comparative advantage between the African Union and the United Nations where the African Union would deploy, for instance, in Darfur and Somalia, Burundi, in places where it was perceived that there's no sufficient peace process in place for the United Nations to deploy. Consent is not there, etc. the things I mentioned before. But increasingly, we, we've seen in the last uh, couple of months especially, for instance, in the Eastern DRC, a mission which uh, previously one would have thought perhaps the UN would leave to the AU, but where it was decided that the intervention brigade would actually deploy as part of the UN mission. Uh, we've seen the, the UN take over the Mali mission, perhaps under circumstances that in previous times or years we would have not thought as ripe yet for the United Nations to take over. And uh, we see the UN now already taking uh, you know, more and more of a, of a role, already proclaiming that it will most probably take over from the AU in six months or so in the Central African Republic, or that it may have to deploy even sooner if, if things seriously, more seriously de deteriorate. So my question here is, what is it that is driving the United Nations to, to um, be more and more willing to take on this role which it previously would have been quite happy to leave to the African Union? 
Is it uh, financial pressures or, or, or what kind of pressures uh, are the driving force behind this, um, I almost want to say, encroachment of the United Nations on the AU's, uh, AU's previous terrain, if one can put it in such uh, in institutional rivalry terms. So um, I just wanted to introduce uh, those, those thoughts about the changing nature and evolution of peacekeeping, which we think is, is important and very relevant to our session today. And um, we now have about 30 minutes or so for questions and answers. So I'll open the floor and um, I'll take about three or so questions and then go back to, to uh, Richard and also to Vega if he would like to, to comment. Um, and then um, we go for another round of questions. Did you want to respond to something before? Yeah. Please do. Could, could I just make yes. one comment Please. on what you said? Because I thought it was... Uh, This might be a little bit outdated, but I, I, you know, we'll, we'll hear what Richard and you think about it. But very often, at least around in the Security Council, and I still think it is, it's, it's not so much a question of a peacekeeping operation. You're just looking for a UN presence, you know, a kind of instrument. So I'm coming back to a great friend, Ian Martin, who wrote this article where he was starting to play around with an idea that we should tailor make an operation that in a way fits the, the conflicts at, start, at such that a kind of that to think too hard about how you organize peacekeeping might not be the answer you need to really know where you're going what you need there because very often the debate and the discussions among those that really make the uh, decisions they don't really have a clue how many troops you have there or what's going on you want to see an SRSG, you want to see a person in charge, you want to see someone who can go and see difficult rebel leaders, you want to see, you want to see, you want to have an actor, you want, you want to have a presence. How that presence, uh, presence UN presence or international community presence, whatever you say, uh, is tailored, w what it looks like, might be a secondary question. That's a very interesting thing and could mean opening away a whole new chapter for peacekeeping. We have some examples. I'm sure uh, the Richard could pitch in a few things. Secondly, very quickly, you know the notion of ne neutrality. I think we've learned a lot about neutrality in international politics and relations over since the wall came down. And neutrality and neutrality, yes. And I also think that the I wouldn't say that the early, the early, uh, you know, the, the people that started out is that they were naive in any way. But, you know, when you, I think at least around in, in the security council, there is the notion that when the UN is there, you are part. I wouldn't say you're part of the problem, but you're at least you're part of the issue. And that's very often why you are there, because you do represent. There, there, there's someone behind. There's someone's interest behind your presence. And it's not always only humanitarian uh, uh, concerns. And I, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing always. The, the notion of neutrality has its uh, a usefulness, but also the fact that when you do inject an element like the UN, you do become part of, of, uh, of the issue. But then you also have to accept that you get enemies. You know? If you are in a place of armed conflict, of high tensions, you, we all have enemies. I mean, to try to live uh, or have an existence in, uh, in, in conflict management without, uh, without not creating uh, enemies would almost be impossible. So it's a highly charged, difficult en 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 environment. But if you do go, uh, go in, you become part of the issue. You will develop uh, uh, enemies, but it will also open a lot of opportunities. Thank you very much. Let me introduce, uh, let me open the floor rather. Ambassador Skokman. Um, I have a privilege of spending a year at the meeting in 1984 in Fargo when uh, Johan Holst uh, initiated the first project here on uh, peacekeeping operations. And uh, I mention it because uh, you have mentioned the amount of change uh, since then. I came back to peacekeeping uh, in the early 90s uh, on the Jochen Leon here uh, who, is, who is here as ambassador of peacekeeping and when we started moving into the second generation of peacekeeping at the end of the Cold War 
But I think you are right, Richard, in pointing out that the changes over the last period is, is almost as radical, as fundamental as uh, during the uh, early 90s. Uh, because really uh, almost everything uh, has been in motion, uh, the key concepts and princ uh, principles, the operational uh, principles, uh, the, uh, uh, the introduction of the civilian and uh, political dimension into the operations. So uh, really a lot of things uh, are, uh, have been set in motion. Uh, over the last uh, month or so, I've had the privilege of traveling with Anne Chester here to Addis Ababa and to UN to sort of look at the uh, linkages between the UN and the uh, African Union uh, on precisely this issue. And I think you, Cedric, in a talk we had before we set out on this journey, said that this relationship has at times been pretty acrimonious. But uh, I think we came away uh, so far, we haven't really concluded yet, but uh, also with a sense that through these uh, acrimonious discussions started out by Darfur, uh, Sudan, Somalia, and now Mali, and the others you mentioned, there has also been uh, a lot of learning, a lot of willingness on both sides to sort of uh, accommodate uh, the concerns of the others. Uh, and and this uh, these changes, these evolving partnerships, I think take place at several levels, at the level of the Security Council in New York and the African Security Council, who now meet regularly twice a year, uh, at least once a year. Uh, task force with the head of the uh, key departments in the UN and the EAU, desk-to-desk -desk cooperation, a uh, strengthening of the uh, UN presence in Addis Ababa with a very uh, professional uh, staff, which is uh, really d giving a lot of both political and practical and logistical support to the uh, attempts made by the African Union. And of course, yourself, Cedric, are also involved in in this uh, review of the uh, of the, uh, uh, the the planning to strengthen the military capability. So, so really, the, we have come away with, uh, with uh, quite uh, positive impressions that things are moving towards uh, new kind of partnerships between the UN and, and the African Union. And somebody mentioned to us, perhaps it was yourself, that it would be much more difficult now to envisage new, new UN operations in Africa without some kind of involvement by the African Union. So this partnership has come, come a long way. I think I, I stop here, but uh, but uh, we always come to you, and I think uh, this uh, report is really a, a quite important tool for those who was who jump in and out of the, all, all this area to get uh, updates both on what's happening in individual operations, but also the analytical overview that yourself is responsible for. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. That I think was very important points to raise. Uh, Karsten Fries. So the next uh, over there. Thank you. Thank you for excellent uh, introductions. Um, I, I work in a group uh, called Security and Defense here at NUPI, and, and on this question of our new robust uh, mandates, it's a, really an area where we, uh, the two groups obviously overlap and common interest. Um, I think it was four years ago I wrote an article where I compared the American counterinsurgency doctrine and, and, uh, and, uh, and the peacekeeping doctrine, and I argue that they're more in common than commonly held. But I didn't expect this reality. This was an academic exercise. I didn't expect this to happen at all in, in reality. Uh, so, so, so that's an interesting. Um, what, yesterday, in we organized a conference. We took stock of Afghan lessons, the whole day military power exercise uh, in a seminar. And, and the question is now: maybe the UN should start learning from from NATO or from from you know the, the military operations of, of NATO and, and America. Um, one of the lessons learned yesterday that we talked about is lack of strategy. And if you do use force without knowing what you want to achieve politically, you're in big trouble. Uh, you just create counterforce. And I'm not an expert on the details of what happens in DRC and other places, but uh, when you have a peace agreement, it's kind of easy because you can refer to that one. If it's, if it's not really in place yet and you don't really know what you want to achieve, uh, yeah, you, you can end up in a very, very difficult uh, difficult situation. So uh, if you could comment on that, I would like to hear that. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And uh, one last uh, question this round, a uh, colleague here from Morgan Planet. Thank you. I just want to um, to add that, that I want an answer to to what Cedric mentioned. That what is driving this change in in mandate and change in profile of the peacekeeping missions? I'm really curious about that. And also one suggestion or one answer that maybe both of you can can uh, comment on is that I have spoken to people at the Defence Forces here in Norway saying that, well, they have been used to practicing what they are training in camps in Norway now by going to Afghanistan. And really, they are really top, top uh, trained people because they practice what they learn. So next year, when they're out of Afghanistan, what comes next? And is, the, is one of the driving forces that uh, defence leaders in the West, they want their special operations units to keep on practicing what they learn. Is that a possible driving force for this more robust mandate? Thank you very much. Let me ask uh, Richard to respond to those questions and comments. Um, uh, a, hu a huge range of questions. Let me, let me take them in reverse order. Um, what is, drive, what is driving these new mandates? Uh, I actually fully agree with um, Vega's point that th the single biggest mistake when studying the UN, and especially the Security Council, is to assume that it is a rational group of people <laughs> looking for good solutions um, to problems they fully understand. Um, uh, the reality is um, that uh, most, most decision-making in the UN is uh, a matter of compromise. And sometimes you get very, very bad compromises, like I think the one that led to the deployment of the Syria mission, where it was always clear that the members of the Security Council did not have a shared political vision of that mission. And in other cases, um, members of the Council are quite honestly, but under a lot of um, time pressure, just coming up with um, the best solution they can find to a problem. And I think that was very much the story in um, in Congo in particular. Uh, I don't think that there was a, a strong sense among members of the council that they were fundamentally changing the future of peacekeeping. I think there was just a huge amount of frustration with the situation in the Eastern Congo. There was a sense of humiliation because in uh, November 2012, um, rebels had overrun the city of Goma, and there was just a desire to find um, some sort of response. And actually, there is a uh, an essay which I wrote in, in, in this book that looks at the Congo case, the Mali case, and the Somalia case, and um, says that in each one, you don't see a clear strategy emerging, coming to your point. You see the council just grappling with problems and coming up with the, the best solution that, um, that they can find. And I think that it is a real source of concern to officials at the UN that they're being given uh, these mandates, which they do not think are always completely thought through. Um, there's a second essay in this volume that emphasizes that uh, it's really essential that when you have these new higher risk mandates that you have really first class um, commanders and um, political efficient officials representing the UN on the ground uh, to implement those mandates and if we are moving towards success in the Congo it is in part because you have a very good uh, German um, uh, civilian head of the mission uh, Martin Kobler and you have a very good Brazilian general uh, General Santos Cruz um, directing those operations. And they have, um, uh, I think they have stewarded, if that's the right verb, um, they have guided the intervention brigade very effectively. They avoided launching offensive operations too early. Um, there, was a, there was pressure to act very, very quickly. They held back. Um, and I think they have done a good job, along with Mary Robinson, the international envoy, of building up a political framework for the use of force. Uh, but if you, And then you look at Mali and you have an excellent Dutch civilian head of mission, Burkunders, guiding, guiding that operation. Uh, 
but we put a huge amount of pressure on the people in the field to make choices. And often it's the guys in the field who are having to work out the strategy after the Security Council has already said, you know, go on, do something. And I, I, I do think this sort of go on, do something um, mentality is, is quite strong in the Council at the moment. It's partially to do with immediate crises. To be absolutely honest, though, it's also because members of the Security Council uh, who pay a large percentage of the cost of these missions are pretty frustrated in some cases with how long some peacekeeping operations have been in the field. I mean, the mission in Congo was launched in 99, although it didn't ramp up properly for a few years. Uh, when you were at the UN, I think there was a presumption that it was going to close in around 2006. Nearly a decade later, it's still there, and it's um, you know still at full strength. And so I think there is, a, there is sometimes a temptation to um, uh, ask peacekeepers to get more robust and start shooting people, because you hope that that will sort of fix the problems that you haven't fixed over the previous decade. And as I said, we were optimistic a couple of years ago that a number of peace operations were going to start shrinking gradually. Um, we don't see that happening so much. And I think that this frustration about how long peacekeeping is going on is, is going to mount. Um, I think that also partially answers your question about is, is there a clear strategy guiding, um, uh, guiding these operations? Again, I mean, I refer you to the the essay in the volume, but I, I would argue that um, there isn't a, there often isn't a clear strategy case by case. Or if there is a strategy, it's being designed by UN officials who are trying to work out how to make the best job possible of um, what the council asks them to do. Um, I think that Mali is, is, a, is going to be a very good case in, in point for that. Um, the UN is in a situation that many UN officials did not want to be in in Mali, being in charge of that force. Um, but uh, very frankly, it was France that um, that pushed very hard for a peacekeeping force. Given France's status on the council, there was no way that the UN could avoid um, setting up MINUSMA. But the UN now has to sort of move forward step by step and work out how to make that mission, uh, that mission work. Um, on on the relationship between the African Union and the UN, um, I agree with you, Ambassador, that I think at the at the operational level there are a lot of frictions, but they are um, very much the frictions you would expect when you have two organisations that are undertaking operations that are high risk um, alongside one another. It would be it would be very very strange if there weren't frictions. Um, I think that overall the operational relationship is considerably more robust. Uh, than it was a few years ago. Um, I think, however, it is it is complicated by political storms like the storm over Libya, where the African Union um, uh, objected to the UN's approach to Gaddafi, and most recently the storm over the International Criminal Court and the African efforts to um, uh, limit the powers of the ICC um, to some extent in Africa. Uh, but at the operational um, uh, the operational dimension it's it's tough but it's i think it's better than we might have expected a few a few years ago um that leads to uh your question about the division of roles should we have a um should we have a system by which we assume that the african union will take on hard military operations while the un does more classical peacekeeping um i think that to some extent, that places some quite dangerous constraints on the African Union. In fact, I think that the, I think that um, casting the African Union as a military organisation that rushes into crises, but is not fully equipped for the long-term multi-dimensional peacekeeping, um, could actually uh, be quite damaging. Um, I think that it's important that. Uh, I think that it's important that the African Union um, also develops uh, civilian crisis management capacities uh, similar to those of the UN, um, so that it can take on a full a full range of missions in future. Uh, equally, I don't think it's realistic um, to try and limit the UN to traditional blue helmet peace operations. I think that. Um, I was going to say that horse has flown, but that makes no sense. Um, 
uh, that that bird has flown. The the idea that left the stable. That horse has left the stable. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a, a, a Norwegian proverb for that. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the um, UN peacekeeping has already, and as I say, almost unintentionally, um, sort of blundered into the world of peace enforcement. Frankly, it's done that over the years. It did that in '95 in, um, in 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 Bosnia. Uh, I think what's important is that we don't sweep it under the carpet. I think that we um, recognise that this is a, a challenge for the UN, and we need the doctrines, uh, and we build up those do doctrines. Um, I don't think we should take on NATO doctrine because, frankly, the UN. I think it would be politically very dangerous to sort of just turn us into the next NATO. Um, uh, it, it wouldn't work. Um, but we do have to be aware of asymmetric threats, and we do have to push the UN to do tough operations. Uh, Mr. Stroman? Uh, quickly, to Torve, no, I, I, I don't really think that it's the, that you want to use your special forces for something that, that drives you. Special forces is very peculiar instrument, uh, very high and very expensive. Uh, it's, um, so I don't think, I'm, uh, I don't think that is a, I don't think that is a, a big driving force. However, on the mandates, I'd like to say that, you know, good thing that you said that to think that all these things still are rational. And one of the things that frightens me a bit is that, you know, there are fewer what, reports from New York indicate that there are fewer and fewer states that actually write mandates. You know, 10 years ago, there were at least all members of Security Council felt we wrote lots of mandates. I'm sure some of it was bad and we fought over it. But we were running around with a pencil all the time. Uh, there seems to be there, there seems to be a tendency that fewer and fewer states three, seem right. to at least hold the pen. You can you can say what you like after the first draft is written. Yeah. But if you're in this business, you know that those that hold the pen, the power of the pen holder is immense in multilateral uh, uh, affairs. I think that's an important thing. It's very, very important. And if these things narrow the discussion on the mandate, at least the initial how you do it, that is not a good thing. And that's actually reverse from what it uh, used to be. The mandate, you, the UN exists in a way in two, in, in, two, in two ways. So, you know, people that work with the UN in a way should have been both places. They, in the field, as Richard is saying, if you have, if you have a good organization, if you have a, a, a group that hang together, well led, but not only well read, but you have a group of people that actually are on a mission and feel a kind of sense of, uh, of, of purpose, they can get a lot of good things done, even with a very strange mandate. Uh, at the UN, in New York in particular, the fight is very much over your own sort of political preferences. It's the kind of thing that you want to have into the document. And then, if not, the whole fight is over. If you get your thing into the mandate, you feel good and you write a good report. And, uh, and that was, in a way, it. What we're doing now and what this report is part of is trying to connect these two things. And like we have tried so much with the gender issue, it doesn't help to fight a huge fight in New York to, to get it into the mandate. Something ha also has to happen out in, out in the fields of how you do it. The, some mandates have been pretty strange. And then very often you don't hear anything if you're in the field from, uh, from uh, they send you the mandate and they hope that you, you know, do your best, which is an old uh, act accordingly, you know, like, like in colonial times, you know, read the instructions and act accord, whatever that means in English or, 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 or any other uh, uh, language. And when, I remember when I was in the former Yugoslavia, some of you might be familiar with Shashi Tarur, whose command of the English language is absolutely brilliant. He's one of these Indians that can write anything in English and you will, you know, it's beautiful. It's almost poetry. And he got the horrible task. After every new resolution was passed, which was relevant to us, he wrote a cable. He wrote a cable. You could immediately see that it was Shashi who wrote the cable. It was gorgeous. It was so well written. But it very often basically said that very hard to figure out what this mandate is. Do your best. You know, we will pray for you. Uh, see what you can do of good. Feel your own instincts. If you can protect anyone, please do. Don't risk your life too much. Do your best. <laughs> you know? uh, we slowly, slowly, we have to come in a way together from the field. I think it's very important to to uh, uh, to get the people in a way back from the field. What could, what can you put in? And if you do put it in, 
what kind of um, uh, uh, what kind of measures uh, should be done in field. One quick comment on that before we go to our last range, uh, last number of questions. Um, I think absolutely we see, as you've described, uh, this the Security Council uh, f forming mandates, trying to to find the best solution and the problem, creating this kind of boutique missions that Ian Ian Martin spoke about, um, driven by I think especially in this media moment uh, moment and the media times we live in now, this kind of need to see to be seen to be acting decisively in the moment. On the one hand, and on the other hand, you have this tension with the field and the missions and people that need a doctrine and that need training and so forth and and the link between the two so I think that um, that tension as you mentioned between the field between the need to have some clarity and on the one hand and the um, the political necessity of coming to to mandates and on the other hand is exactly what's creating this tension between the two uh, between the two sides um, one of the ways that I think that, that can be narrowed again is that those that hold the pen become more active in peace operations. And as we see now, for instance, with the Netherlands and others becoming more active, one would hope that that would feed back then to also that kind of direct back, you know, behind the scenes and behind the floor, uh, communication and information flowing between those taking the decisions and those in the field. Because the disjunction between who's actually doing it on the ground and who's taking the decisions at the moment, I think, is, is also causing some of those tensions between the two. Okay, we have a large uh, opportunity for a last a number of questions. We have about 10 minutes or so left. Um, Ulf, the director of Nupi, Ulf Sverre. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you so much and con congratulations with a very interesting report. And thank you to the, all three of you for uh, for excellent contributions. I have, as I I haven't read the full report yet, but as I, I listen to it and, and have a look at it, I see it very much as covering the supply side of the peace operations side. Um, and you made some remarks on this and the difficulties with the mandate, difficulties in getting trained staff, etc., capabilities. But if I challenge you to, to kind of, this would probably expand your report, but the uh, kind of two other elements I think would be important in having this kind of annual review of global peace operations and that the first would be the demand side how do you see it is is it so that we are now entering a world where there's more demand for these kind of operations so how is the demand side affecting kind of the P global peace operations uh, so that's the first thing and the other thing is of course whether now based upon your assessments Harry would you say something are we moving towards a world where we are more effective in achieving the results in the ground, or becoming less effective, or more legitimate, etc. So these things, as I, far as I see it, just by skimming through the pages, is not so well covered in the report. So the demand side and the and the actual results, whereas the supply side, is very well developed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulf. Um, then Anne Chersifron from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, first of all, thanks to both of you. Um, I would just like to note one thing about uh, the Congo case, and that is that um, in, in the Congo, the UN was in a way in a very difficult position because uh, the fact that they didn't act uh, when the M23 uh, uh, attacked uh, was also becoming a very difficult problem for them because they were seen as not being credible by the civilian population. So, I mean, being um, impartial is also a challenge for the UN. <clears throat> but I think also uh, with regard to Congo, it's important to note that the inter Intervention Brigade is um, a new, um, what should I say, um, uh, 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 in instrument for the UN. But what was perhaps even more important in the Co Congo case was the fact that these 11 countries in the region managed to agree uh, on a political framework and I think we should be very careful not to forget the importance of the political process. And that brings me back to the importance of prevention and political missions. And I wonder if you could say something about that, because I think that is where we continue to fail. We have to do more on prevention and on political process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else would like to ask a question? Okay, I think then we'll keep it to those two. I'm just going to add a tag on to what, what uh, Anishasti said, just to also say, I, 
I think um, it's dangerous to prematurely um, pat ourselves on the back and say that the intervention brigade, you know, were successful or brought a resolution. Uh, because for the, I think certainly for the moment, the M23 is one of many rebel groups that have come and gone, but and for the moment uh, we've suppressed that threat. But as we've seen in so many other cases, also learning from the lessons from NATO and Afghanistan and so on, is that once there's this kind of a robust response, very often the insurgents or whatever you would like to call them, you know, falter away and come back later when when the pressure is off. So the necessity of, of following up on the political process and using the security progress to make uh, political progress is absolutely important. And there's always this danger that peacekeeping, especially the more robust it becomes, can be this fig leaf of action. It's, it's as I mentioned earlier, it's, we seem to be acting decisively when we do these kind of things, but actually we're just creating space for political processes that need to unfold. Thank you very much. Last comments from, let's start with uh, Mr. Stroman this side and then give Richard the, the last word as our guest, and then uh, we'll close up. Thank you. Yeah, I could see a role for the UN many, many places. And if uh, we were permanent members of the Security Council, which we should be, which would be, <laughs> which would be a righteous thing. <laughs> um, so if we were permanent members and could write the mandates, you know, I, I'm sure we would dispatch a number with the best of conscience. Uh, but there, there's a there's a stretch there. We we're not there quite yet. Uh, but I could see I could see that. But I would at the same time, you know, it's not a, it's not an answer unless you sort of link it maybe to what Ian Martin is saying that you should tailor make these things. It's like individual medicine, which we're probably he heading into. There really isn't a kind of doctrine, a kind of system that we thought in the old days setting up of force, so many infantrymen, so much logistical support, so much this or that, and the civilian affairs uh, uh, office where you send out someone from uh, DPA uh, who's been around and he runs the rest. Those days are gone. It has to be, in a way, a, a tailor-made. But if you accept that, I could see a huge role for maybe smaller missions, but that does have also, in a way, a kind of peacekeeping element. It's linked to the my other point, and then it would be more effective. I'm, I'm, I actually, I'm attracted to the idea of this individual or maybe smaller missions that they would be very, that they would actually be quite, quite, uh, quite effective. Look at some of the, you know, just to take what happened in Syria. I thought it was very useful for a while, uh, and that it was fantastic that they managed to get around, uh, and that the observer m mission served at least some, some kind of purpose for a while. The third thing, and this is my, going to be my final comment. You know, these things exist in a way on three levels. First, there is the mandate. There's the fight in New York. There's what's what, what's going on, uh, and uh, and there to get the mandate, you get in your place, you have your political priorities, you fight it out, which also got a lot to do with your own politics and how you see the world and what you think is important. Secondly, this is how this this is works out in the field. It's how how re respond, and there should be a, maybe a little bit of we speak about robust interpretation, you know, that you uh, do your, there's always an element to do your best. And deep responsibility if you're in a, a zone of conflict, you know, risking the lives of, 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 uh, of your collaborators. I mean, there's always, there's always that, that element. But there's a third level, which is the public perception of these things, Torv and others in the, in the media business. Because those three levels don't really correspond. And it's very, very easy to jump from the mandate debate. But the moment you know you have the media at the door and the world attention and everything, you move one level up. It becomes a, the public perception of why you are there. You know, and that you, know, you see and you start seeing television pictures of, of armed uh, UN you know, soldiers, units. Why didn't they do something? You know, if they're there, I used to live for many years in America, and very often that is the angle that comes up. There's some armed international people there, so why don't they go and do something about these bad things that are uh, that are happening? And that is also dangerous. It's dangerous towards the field, but it's also the fact that that's the courage, courage. That is the point you where you really gotta sort of step up. If they're there for a purpose. If the, if the ability, then you've got to go up, not only and 
protect uh, uh, the mission and what you're doing inside the UN, but you also got to do it in public. So that there's a re realistic public perception of what can be done and what should be done. Uh, not only about what can be achieved, but also about the limitations. Thank you very much. And then Richard. Um, I mean, yes, in, in response to your point about the Congo, um, I'm certainly not declaring victory for, for the UN. I, I completely agree that um, there is a, a high risk of further conflict. I mean, we know that the M23 rebels were heavily supported by Rwanda. If Rwanda wanted to launch another rebel group in the Eastern Congo tomorrow, it would be able to do so. And that is a, a fact of regional regional politics. Um, I think what I see as a success, though, is that the brigade did not um, blunder into some of the risks which even UN officials had foreseen. For example, um, uh, undertaking offensive operations in which a significant number of civilians might be killed as collateral damage, as has sometimes happened in Afghanistan. And as I say, I think that um, the brigade has avoided that sort of tactical setback in part because of smart leadership, as well as the um, restraint of individual troops on the ground. But no, I think in strategic terms, the story is very far from over. Um, prevention and political missions. Um, it's worth saying this volume covers, uh, I'm not quite sure how many political missions now, it's um, well over 50. Um, the vast majority of political missions are not involved in prevention. Um, they are either like the mission in Somalia, involved in peace, give, peace building or governance support, um, or like the, uh, like the Anand Brahimi mediation, are actually trying to end an active conflict. Um, the multilateral system is very bad at deploying truly purely defensive, um, sorry, preventive, um, purely preventive um, operations of any type. And there are major obstacles, including often high power politics, or simply the fact that um, countries at risk of, risk of conflict will not accept um, a preventive deployment of troops or civilians on their territory. Uh, the one, uh, one positive development uh, in this regard we've seen in recent years is a new emphasis at the UN on setting up regional offices. Um, in West Africa, Central Asia, and most recently Central Africa, that have preventive mandates. And so there is a, an envoy, as I'm sure you know who sits in Dakar, um, who has done great work flying to and from Gu Guinea, Mauritania, um, Mali for a time, uh, trying to prevent conflicts. And it seems, from what we can see, that that sort of regional approach is actually more effective um, than attempting to put uh, individual political missions into um, countries at risk of conflict where they probably just won't be welcome. Um, and there is an excellent piece um, uh, you can find on the web called Multilateral Political Missions and Preventive Diplomacy uh, by me <laughs> that um, <laughs> looks at this in more detail. Um, the questions about demand and efficiency. Um, firstly, I think uh, what you say is true. Um, this is by its nature, um, a volume that looks at capabilities and um, operations more than some of those other issues. I would emphasize, though, that a, a good chunk of the volume is given over to analysis and narrative that I think touches on many of the political questions that you, um, uh, you refer to. Um, demand is incredibly complicated. What do we mean by demand? Um, uh, what's the demand for the mission in Mali? Uh, the actual demand for the mission in Mali came from France, in essence. Um, and the actual demand for the intervention brigade in the Eastern Congo came from neighboring African countries. Um, so the demand, for, the demand for a mission can actually be from outside the affected country. Um, when you look inside the country, are you looking at um, what the government wants? Um, you know, the, the government of Mali has some very strong views on what that mission should and should not do. In fact, uh, it, the government of Mali clearly doesn't want the mission to look into organized crime in Mali because the government is involved in organized crime in Mali. Um, or are you looking at the level of the people? 
Um, and this is something which John has worked on. And there's a, a piece you can pick up over there on this very topic. Are you looking at actually how individual communities um, view view the presence of a mission? Because again, to just continue this Malian case, how the Tuareg and the Arabs see the mission is probably very different to how um, the Africans living in Bamako um, see the mission. So demand is, is just very, very difficult to analyze. Being sort of hyper strategic and, and macro in, a, in approach, I think we would argue that overall demand is going to continue to rise, um, judging by certain statistics around fragility and so on. But it's very difficult to break it down in a volume of this type, although it can be done and I, Newby has been working on that. Um, efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, I think this is a huge question and one that uh, needs to be addressed at both the analytical and political level. Um, as I say, I think that uh, for too long the, Council, the Security Council has been satisfied just to have um, uh, people on the ground in a country suppressing fighting. Um, and this is why so many missions have gone on for so much longer than was expected. And from the Security Council's point of view, you know, everything being quiet on the Liberia front is actually all right. It's a pretty cheap way to avoid a humanitarian disaster and keep the media um, off, off the council's back. Um, but I do think that we have to uh, push for more thinking on what really makes missions succeed. Um, I think that in the NATO case, although I don't study NATO so closely, the fact that um, NATO is leaving Afghanistan has made people concentrate quite hard on what has been achieved in Afghanistan and where there was um, success and failure. Um, I have been arguing uh, provocatively around the UN that we should admit that the operation in Darfur um, has been a failure. And I think probably um, most people who work on it agree that that mission has been a failure. I think we should admit defeat and pull it out. And we should then look at why uh, the mission uh, has failed. But the Security Council will not do that because it does not want the, the blood on its hands that would result. But there is a great tendency, I think, with the UN as a whole, just to keep the mission going and say that it's doing all right and um, uh, never admit defeat or failure. And I think that is a, that is a real problem. Oh, Richard, you're leaving us on a little bit of a negative note. Mm. We needed one of your jokes to, to, to end, the, end the afternoon off. Um, Maybe the, the, the Norwegian metaphor we were grappling, grappling for was, was the salmon or the cod escape from the net. It yes. could be a, a difference. Okay, thank you very much, Berg uh, of Richard Gowan, for joining us here today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us and uh, participating in this, this discussion and thinking together through how peacekeeping is uh, evolving and changing. Thank you very much. Good.